to talk with you all. Um, uh, you know, I had uh, the, 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 the Ortiz brothers reached out. Uh, shoot, I don't even know how long ago it was now because, uh, you know, I flipped it. I flipped it on them quicker than they even asked because as soon as they asked me, I said, well, that's great. Uh, uh, why don't y'all do our call in two weeks? I think they asked me to do it, Brian, in like a month and a half, right? They, they are very organized, right? There are very few people who get a speaker a month and a half ahead of time. That was impressive. Late, what's happening, brother? Man, I see a lot of folks I know on here, man. So, um, but it's a, it's an honor to get the chance to speak with you all. Um, and I'm not going to take a lot of y'all's time this, this morning, but uh, going through a couple of things. Um, uh, you know, as they said, I've been in the business this year will mark 20 years in the business, which is amazing. It doesn't even feel like that. I was 24 when I got started, had never heard of Primerica, knew nothing about it. Um, and and to, to see what has transpired in our life and in our business and in the lives of the people who we've had the privilege of working with and connecting with is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, uh, so I, it's so many different things that I want to do and attempt to cover with you guys in the next couple of minutes. But what I'll do, I think will probably help to, um, to, to, to lead a couple of things. So what I'm going to do is share my screen. Um, give me one second and, uh, and I'll do that. And so what we have, uh, let's go here. Uh, you know, just real quick, I was very, I've been extremely fortunate and a lot of you all have probably learned this already that the way an entrepreneur thinks and the way an employee thinks is totally different. I was raised by entrepreneurial parents, successful entrepreneurial parents. And so that, that kind of gave me a foundation that was different than a lot of people that joined Primerica. See, listen, you got to get this. Uh, most people, when they join Primerica, they think they know themselves well until Primerica starts. It's, it's a mirror that shows all of the inside. And most people don't want to see the inside. They, they don't realize that they may be weak in some places, that they may be deficient in some areas, right? And in my belief, that's why most people quit because Primerica starts showing them things about themselves that they would rather not see, okay? And so uh, when I came here, I knew myself very well. A lot of people think they know themselves well until they get here, right? And if they're the, uh, the right type of person, the type of person that we're looking for, they're willing to reveal themselves to themselves, find out about themselves and change and grow and become a better version of themselves. That's how you, you enable your, that's how you become successful in Primerica. You gotta change, you gotta grow, right? All, all, all growth demands you to change. And a lot of people don't wanna change. A lot of people are comfortable being who they are, how they are, right? And that doesn't mean they're a bad person, right? There's a lot of people who are good people and unsuccessful people, right? Just because a person's unsuccessful in life doesn't mean they're not a good person, right? But if you want to become successful, right, um, then you got to become a better version of yourself, right? So I, I came here, fortunately, knowing myself well. You know, I was always taught that I was a leader and winner. And so when I get the opportunity to cover things with folks' organization, first of all, I never take it for granted. Thank you so much, Toga, for giving me the opportunity to talk with your team, but, but also what needs to be cl clarified is that I hope that you gain way more from the conversation today than just uh, how to per personally produce, uh, how to build a base shop, uh, how to make money in Primeric. I hope you get way more than that, right? Uh, I hope you get the things that really, truly matter uh, long term. Primerica can be an absolutely amazing vehicle that can enable you to be able to expose yourself, expose your family, uh, and help them become, you know, get, you know, get a greater worldview, right? Because money can do that, right? But ultimately, I hope that that it helps in a lot of other ways. See, I, I was when I was in middle school, I was a president of my school, right? President of my my middle school, and and that was a big deal. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm born and raised in Louisiana. And, um, and so at the school, and I went to a, 
uh, uh, LSU's laboratory school. So, 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 you know, it's probably about 10% black kids in the class. And so that was a even bigger deal, um, you know, to, to get, get to the point. But what I was taught, uh, what, oh, hold on. What I was taught is, hey, look, man, if you're the best person for the job, you need to go for the job. You know, and, and, you know, if you're the best person for the situation, you need to go for that. I was in high school, guys. Listen, when I was in high school, I was a, a, a it's, it's funny to think about now. I was a five foot seven, 125 pound freshman who had goals of a long term goal of playing college basketball and a short term goal of just making the bar. Five, seven, 125 pounds. It's a little bit tough to think about that now at 15 years old. That's what I was. A year later, I was 5'10". A year later, I was 6'1", and I was 6'4". Uh, and I, you know, uh, started putting on a little bit of weight. And, but I, but as a junior in high school, you all, I woke up every morning between 4.45 and 5 a.m. to work out, to shoot, to lift weights, to jump rope. Because I realized that if I wanted to hit my goal, right, I was going to have to accelerate my growth. I was going to have to accelerate. So I'm telling you these things and I'm telling you my story, but I need you hopefully to get, I'm not talking about my, you know, my, my, my growth as an athlete, my growth as a student. I'm talking about hopefully how you apply the thought process, the mentality to your primarical business. And I'm talking about the things that enabled me to learn who I was. Right. And, and to move the way I moved when I got into America. See, I went to RVP in about nine months. Guys, you'll see. Get this point. It only takes you six to nine months to go to RVP. Now, it might take you five years. But the process to go to RVP is only about six to nine months. The reason it maybe took you five years was because it took you a year and a half, I mean, four and a half years to figure who you were out. Now, once you figure that out, it's going to take you six to nine months to go to RVP. As I've been saying, I knew who I was when I came here. So I was on my RVP run the day I signed up. Think about that. It doesn't take, I have an RVP now. She's been with me for about 15 years. She, she had, had been with me at that point for probably about 12 years had never done more than 10,000 in 10 recruits and had done that one time. Most times she did three to 4,000, if that, right? And she had just been spare time for a long time, but she was always around, great personality, showed up. And one day she decided, I'm really going to make an RVP run. Now she had told me that before. Y'all know how it is, right? She had told me that before. But once she really decided, and as a regional leader, decided, listen, I want an office. I want to pay rent. I'm going to be up here every day. I'm going to be on it, making my calls, doing the things I need to do. God, she literally went from, and, and when she ran the 10,000, that had been like four or five years earlier. Right? But when she decided to do that, she was at about $1,000. The month before, she had done $1,000. She said, I'm, I'm really making my run right now. Her, 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 her dad had passed away. She had really been doing some reflecting on her life. And you all, she literally, six months later, she had qualified for RVP doing 25 by 25 and back-to-back -back months. And had been in the business now prior for 12 years already and had never had done 10,000 one time and had never done anything more than that before. And six months later, back-to-back -back 25 by 25 and had built like five new district leaders. So what's my point? It was in her, but she just hadn't made a decision and she hadn't really figured out who she was. See guys, all of these things on the screen helped me understand who I was way before I came into Primerica. And so I'm saying that because you shouldn't beat yourself up when you look at the speed with which I had success. You just need to understand it's possible for you to have success quickly, but you got to learn and you got to figure out who you are and what you're willing to, to fight for. See, now I got to LSU. I played ball at LSU. I followed in my dad's footsteps, played ball at LSU, um, Louisiana State University. He was the first African-American to play ball there. Um, quick story about that. Interesting how things come full circle, you all. In the 1950s, my grandfather, uh, who had a, um, had a degree 
in in uh, agriculture from from a H, uh, HBCU here in Louisiana. Literally, he he tried to go to LSU to get his master's degree, and uh, the state of Louisiana said you can't come to LSU because we're not letting African Americans in LSU. Uh, we understand you pay taxes. We understand that it's the state, the 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 flagship university of state. But listen, you can't come to LSU. We're not going to let you pay your way to LSU. In fact. He had to fight. He and Thurgood Marshall. He was a part of a class action lawsuit with Thurgood Marshall. The state of Louisiana paid for him, legislatively paid for him to go out of the state and go to Michigan State. They said, "Look, you can pick any other college. You just can't come to LSU." Wow. So he said, "Look, Lizzie, look, rather than going through all of this, and he went to Michigan State when this got his master's degree from Michigan State." moved back, was a principal at the high school that all of his kids graduated from and that my dad was about to graduate from until he, uh, until uh, integration happened in 1969, his senior year, right? And he ultimately graduated. And, and the governor of Louisiana, not the basketball coach, the governor called my grandfather 15, 16, probably 12 to 15 years after all that stuff happened with him, and said, sir, we want you to allow your son to integrate LSU's basketball program. So, so ver instead of being bitter, instead of being bitter, it's like, look, really, this is an interesting turn of events, right? He was better, and he was thinking about the overall well-being of his son, the overall well-being of his community, the overall well-being of the state of Louisiana, and ultimately the overall well-being of where the United States was headed. And he, because my dad didn't really want to, be Jackie Robinson, pushed my dad into uh, and said, this is what you need to do. And you need to deal with all the stuff that comes with it, that's going to come with it. And you need to deal with it in a way because it was, I had to be about way more than basketball in that situation, right? So I followed in my dad's footsteps, went to LSU, took advantage of being on scholarship. This is a primary point, took advantage of being on scholarship. Scholarship. With a scholarship, you can get as much education as you want. They say, look, as long as you got eligibility, we're going to keep paying for you to go to school. And so I was thinking about that. You all, my first day at playing ball, I got hurt. My first day at LSU, first practice, I got hurt. And so when I got hurt, instead of like, like look, this is another point, the bounce back factor. How quickly do you recover? How quickly do you bounce back from seemingly negative circumstances from stuff that seems like it's just so bad and it's just so detrimental to your success. How quickly do you recover? How quickly do you bounce back? Do you take a long time on the mat or do you get back up quickly? Y'all literally from the time I was six years old to six years, I mean, to, to 18 when I got to LSU, you couldn't, I mean like, like I always wanted to be an LSU basketball player. I was a ball boy when I was in the third grade. Uh, I'm still friends with Shaquille O'Neal. A uh, guy named Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. Then his name was Chris Jackson, the most prolific freshman scorer in the history of the NCAA. Right? I was a ball boy for these guys when I was when I was young, and I, like I said, I still maintain relationships with them. Right? So I saw that, and I and I wanted to be a part of that. So what I ended up doing, I was so excited about being a LSU basketball player. And the first day of practice, I get hurt. I even though my senior year at, uh, at, at, in high school, I averaged 30 points, like like um, 10 rebounds, 10 assists. I People still doubted if I was a value-adding member to the team, okay? So interestingly enough, um, uh, and then the first day I got hurt, but I thought and I learned, you got to find a way to use that haters as motivators. Now, remember this. Positive positivity is always a better motivator than negativity in every and any case. But negative people will always be around us, always be among us. And rather letting them pull us down, rather letting, uh, allowing them to cause us to get bitter, to cause us to get negative, to cause us to think like them, operate like them, move like them, be like them. We got to find a way to turn that and help make that help make that be a motivating factor for us, right? Because they're gonna be there, right? And and most people, quite honestly, I wasn't strong enough to completely just ignore them. So I found a way to turn it into a a, a motivational uh, thing. Now it wasn't a, my primary motivator, 
it wasn't like I was looking for negative people. I was obviously would much rather positive people and positive in reinforcement. But if there is going to be negative and there will be, you got to find a way to turn that into positive. You all, while I was laying on the training table, I figured out in my mind, I had gone to summer school, taken six hours my first summer, right? I was current, I was at that point in that first semester in 16 hours. Right? Anybody goes to college, you know, we're taking a lot of classes already. I figured out in my mind, if I do this next semester, this during the summer, and I laid it out while I was laying on the training table, Jason, I could graduate. And I, I was laying on the training table. My mom sits standing on one side. My dad, I looked at my mom. I said, didn't you graduate in three and a half years? Now, guys, think about it. I'm 18. First day of practice, I got hurt. And she's like, what is that? In her mind, I know she was thinking, what does that have to do with what we're dealing with right now? But I was like, in my brain, I'm like, I can't do anything about this situation as it is. The doctor has let me know that I'm probably going to be done for the year. First day of practice, y'all. And I already shifted my thought to, okay, how can I make this a positive? How can I make this a positive? Ended up graduating three years with a degree in business. And because I had to redshirt my first year, I still had two years of eligibility after I graduated, right? And so I ended up, my, my junior year, I got my master's degree. Uh, interestingly enough, halfway through my junior year, putting up great numbers, right? Probably would have been gone after that year, but tore up my ankle halfway through the season. Uh, and I got my master's degree, came back for my senior year, had a good senior year, went to the tournament, and I ended up getting picked up by the... Um, by the uh, you know by the Detroit Pistons, it says uh, you know on the screen education stay focused. The point of that, from a primarical business perspective, is guys, life circumstances is, are going to happen. Life is going to happen. Life is good. Life is 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 challenging. Life is up and down and in and out and hot and cold. I'm telling you now, life is going to happen. All the people who you just saw that won, they have they did not have whether that was so far this month, it seemed like that was last month's recognition. They didn't have a perfect life during last month. They just did what they needed to do regardless of how things were and were successful anyway. I promise you, all of them people, everything wasn't perfect last month, right? They just did it anyway, right? And so the mentality of, well, you don't know what I'm going through. You're right, I, I don't, I don't. And unfortunately, it really is irrelevant because at the end of the day, it's not going to have an asterisk next to your numbers and say, well, asterisk, you don't need to count this month because they were going through this. It doesn't matter. And it sounds rough. It sounds tough. It sounds somewhat it may be insensitive, but the reality is either you got it done and you didn't. Right. So you got to think about that. You got to better stay focused in the midst. Listen, not just of the challenging circumstances, but when great things happen, are you able to repeat? Can you keep going? Right. And so, listen, I planned on playing in the NBA. Guys. I got I told you I picked up by the Pistons. Uh, everything happens for a reason, though. Got picked up by the Pistons, played in the summer league, played against LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Carmelo Anthony in that 03 class and had a great summer league. Uh, was named one of the top three shooters in the Orlando Summer League in 2003 and tore up my ankle working out after training, I mean, after summer league, right before training camp. And I was a free agent. I didn't get drafted. I got picked up as a free agent. And so uh, I tore up the same ankle that I already had surgery on my junior year at LSU. Same ankle, tore it up two years later. And, and I had to make a tough decision. Now, two things happened. I got the opportunity. Somebody asked me to come sign some autographs and and uh, take some pictures with some, some local kids uh, at, at, at an event, right? And so I went and did that on a Saturday. And the guy, after I did it, asked me, uh, he asked me if he could take me to lunch. I said, yeah, of course, man, I'm, I, you know, to, to kind of repay me. So, so he says, now look, I, you know, I think I told you, Kyle, I'm doing something part-time uh, with this company and I'm working with a guy that he said that you probably know him or know of him Bill Whittle. Said, yeah, I know Mr. Whittle. And the reason I knew Bill Whittle is he played ball with my dad at LSU. He was a year ahead of my dad at LSU. But for a semester, they were roommates. And uh, 
So I knew him, but I didn't know what he did. I ne literally never heard of Primaris. And now you got to think about it, you all. I got my undergrad degree. I got my master's degree. I was working on my PhD in education while I was a senior at LSU. Now, if the story ended there, how much of a full circle moment would that have been? Grandfather was not even allowed to come to LSU and his grandson got an undergrad degree, master's degree, and part of a PhD paid for by the same university that he couldn't even go to. That would have been great. There's more to the story, right? So, so the guy asked me to come to lunch. I said, yes, Bill Whittle. I said, look, I mean, you're going to pay for lunch. You, you know, you could have your mama at the lunch. Great. Okay, whoever. I, Mr. Whittle's good. I mean, I didn't know him that well. I knew him. I saw him around summer basketball. I knew his son, Blake. I didn't have a deep relationship with him, but I knew him, right? They was good guys, right? And my, they played ball with my dad. So you see him, hey, how you doing, Blake? What's happening, Mr. Whittle? Doing? So you kind of, you know, you had a, a, a surface relationship. Um, and so, so think about this, you all. Uh, we go, now that morning is the morning I got injured. It's on a Monday morning. Saturday, it's Monday morning. That morning I got re-injured. Now, how many times, this is a primarical point, how many times, probably just in the, this week, this week that's, you know, we, we're finishing up. How many appointments have stood you up this week? Not only stood you up, they didn't answer the phone when you called. They didn't answer the text message, right? They still haven't called yet. And let's be real. We get frustrated when that happens, right? I'm, a, I'm about to help you. I'm going to take a burden off of you. You shouldn't be frustrated. You should be thankful. Because what that person's telling you before you waste any of your valuable time with them, they're raising their hand and saying, I'm not who you're looking for. I'm not who you're looking for. I'm not a person of integrity. I'm not a person of character. I'm not a person of my word. I'm not going to do what I say. You shouldn't waste your time with me. They're telling you that before you even waste any time with them, right? So you should be thankful because what they're letting you know is that that's not who you're looking for. You need to go find somebody else. Now, I don't know, I, I don't know in the natural why I showed up. I know why. I know who pushed me to that appointment because I had just gotten injured that morning at six and going to the trainer, going to the doctor, and I'm and I have a noon appointment. I don't know in the natural why I limped into that appointment, knowing in the back of my mind. Because when I got hurt, I literally sat down, I was running stadiums, I sat down. And I was just boo-hoo crying because that was the first time I was 24. And since I was six, you could not tell me I was not going to play in the NBA for 10 years. All the injuries I dealt with, all the challenges, I still was laser focused. And I said, I'm going to make this happen because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, I got my degrees and I took care of my school. But everything I did was to bolster my, my resume for an opportunity to play, be a professional basketball player. And that was the first time, that was the first time on September 22nd, 2003 at 6.30 a.m. in the morning. I remember it like yesterday. I remember the exact time that I realized you might not play in the NBA for 10 years. Now you might not play, but you, you probably gonna have a tough time making it because you can't move laterally. You do not have a tendon in your right ankle that can keep it from turning. So, but I walked into that meeting at noon. I had a, y'all gonna laugh at this, 2003, right? So don't judge me. I had a brown velour Sean John jumpsuit on. Eric, you know what you know about that, Eric, right? With 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 cream ah. accents. Oh, well. That's how that's how that's how I walked into the to the meeting because we just going to lunch. He didn't tell me ah. we're gonna recruit you. We going I just walked into the meeting. So we sit down and sat down, Mr. Widow. Obviously, they got a tie on. He's looking nice, and he starts going through the presentation. Now, remember, I just think we're going to lunch. I'm kind of like, what's going on here? And you remember, I got an undergrad degree. I got a master's. I went through business and finance, economics, right? I've gone through all of that. Never heard of Rule 72. Hold up, what, what is this? Never heard of Rule 72. Didn't know anything about life insurance. I was 24, single, no house, no kids, no job. But it was still intriguing. But that Rule 72 really got my attention. That grabbed my attention. And I said, man, this is some important information. 
But that, so the concepts got my attention. But then the second thing, the nonchalant nature with which Bill Whittle talked about the fact that he had earned, um, <laughs> that he had earned, how much was it at that time? And he was earning about $200,000 a month. The nonchalant nature. Because look, look, DC, look, what he did, Jonathan, he told me, in the middle of a sentence, without any exclamation point, without a comma, without anything, Mitch, what he said, Chanda, was, hey, you know, I make about $200,000 a month. And look, and he kept going. Like, that was the middle of the sentence. There was no, no <laughs> kind of, and listen, y'all remember on Charlie Brown when the teacher is talking and it's womp, 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 right? Her mouth, he was talking, but I, was like not hearing what he was saying because I was still stuck on what he had said earlier in the sentence. Does that make sense? Yep. And I literally let him talk for about four seconds. I said, I'm sorry. Um, I need you to go back. I just want to get clarity. Um, I just want to make sure I heard correctly because it sounded like you said you make about $200,000 a month, $250,000 a month. Every th it's every 30 days, right? I do, I mean, you know, just making sure that I heard correctly. And when he said yes, I'm like, hmm, okay. <laughs> um, and so, so the, that was the, and it wasn't the number as much as it was the nonchalant nature with which, the, the, the cavalier nature with which he said it. You see what I'm saying? I'm like, he ain't new to this. This is like, like real, right? Like you ain't selling dope. Okay, where we sign up for this, does that make sense? So, right, so that was the second thing. And then the third thing, when he talks about you can own it, you can own it, you can own it. Now, you remember all I know is entrepreneurship. So I already know I'm gonna be in business with Toya. I just didn't know what business it was gonna be. My parents were already successful entrepreneurs. They were in the nonprofit field, you know, but, and my dad just didn't want me to be that guy that was 29, 30, still chasing after the basketball. Is he said, you have way more to offer than your ability to bounce the basketball. Now, my brother has been my younger, youngest brother. I have two brothers. My youngest brother has been uh, blessed and done an absolutely amazing job. He's been in the NBA for 14 years. Wow. He's, he's been durable. But in high in college, I scored way more points than Garrett. Had a way better better career than Garrett, seemingly better career than Garrett. But he's just more durable, and he was a phenomenal player. And so folks say, well, who was better? I say the guy that's made fifty million dollars playing basketball is the better player. I say so. I mean, it's just you know, I don't, regardless of what, what you know what happened. Uh, Mr. Ortiz, the guy that made fifty million dollars playing basketball for a living, look, he's the better. He's he's got to be the better one, right? All right. So, so Bryn, what what I, I ended up doing is I, I ended up signing up. Now, here's another primarica point: winners are winners are chasers. Winners are chasers. Good. See, Bill Winter went through the presentation. Like this is like Jerry Maguire. He had me at hello, right? But he didn't close me. He gave me the information. And Jackie, he said, uh, take this, take the information. And, and, and the information was like a packet. The old How Money Works book, the green one, that was like 80 pages, right? All right. So like, he gave me Company of Destiny and all these brochures. And he said, uh, take the information. Take a look at it. Give me a call if you have any interest. He didn't close me at all. So I said, OK. Okay. Now, it, think about it, guys. At 6 a.m., I just got injured. And my dream, my, my, the, the thing I wanted to do in my life, it, 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 it was gone. It was seemingly, and, you know, it was very questionable. And I understood that. But, but all I could think about was what he had told me and the opportunity. I went home. I read everything. How many times do y'all send somebody a PDF or you give them a brochure you, and you call them up four days later and they've been busy? How many know what I'm talking about? Right, they've been busy. They hadn't had time. They broke, but they busy, right? Okay. I read everything. 
all of it, Julio, everything. And then I couldn't go to sleep. And when I did go to sleep, I woke up at noon at midnight. I went to sleep, tried to go to sleep about 10, woke up at midnight, woke up again at three, woke up at five, couldn't go back to sleep. Six o'clock comes, and I'm like, I can't call them this early, this too early. Seven o'clock comes. Now y'all know, I know for some of y'all, you we gotta go way back, right? But you be at the club, you get a, a young lady's phone number. But you can't call her the next day. Y'all know what I'm talking. You can't call the next day, right? You seem, you know, desperate. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all looking at me like you have no clue what I'm talking about, right? But you can't call the next day, right? Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Well, let me help y'all. I at seven o'clock, I said he's a very successful businessman. He probably is rolling already, right? Because my, my dad taught me the motto was uh, can't get ahead staying in the bed. Can't get ahead staying in the bed. You better work like a slave and think like a master. So I'm thinking he's probably up already. I called that man at 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, how you call at 7 o'clock and not seem overly interested? <laughs> so I called him. And Jackie, I said, um, um, Mr. Whittle, you know, I'm I glanced over the information that you that you gave me. I thought it was very interesting, you know, pretty interesting. I think I might be interested. I glanced over it. I didn't glance over it. I read every page and every brochure he gave me. But I'm trying not to seem, you know, like you got me already, right? And he said, when is a chaser? Mitch, he said, uh, okay, great. We need to get together sometime this week. It's like, what you doing today? Right? Okay. And he go, winners are chasers. So we met for lunch. Then we went through the fast start planner. Now, look, he, he, listen, you know what I've realized in hindsight? All of these things he was doing, he was baiting me. He was baiting me. He was, he was reading and seeing how I was reacting to different things, right? So you got to know as a recruiter how to throw bait and what people and, and how to read if you have a big fish. Because what he did, Leighton, was he said during the fast start planner, most people who go to RVP do it in about 18 to 24 months. He hadn't explained what RVP was yet, Mayor. I said, hmm, I'll do it in nine. Because my brain said if most people do anything in 18 months, I'm going to do it in half the time that most people do it in. I didn't know what RVP was yet. Yo, I, Julio, I qualified for RVP in nine and a half months. But that happened because he put out there that most people did it in 18 to 24 months. And before he explained what it was, I had decided in my brain, I'm going to do it in nine months. And I didn't go out doing minimal numbers. I mean, you know, for the time 20 years ago, I went out doing about 35,000, 30 recruits. And so, y'all, you know, check it out. I told him I'd do it in nine months, right? And then he started explaining what it took to go to district leader. And he said, we need to go on at least three appointments a week and We'll qualify for district in six weeks. And I, and, I, and I stopped them, right? Winners are chasers. It's the first part of true coachability. Seek out the help. Seek out the help. This is what I said. I said, no disrespect, Mr. Whittle. Uh, I need you to tell me how to get where you are as fast as possible. I don't think three appointments a week is going to get it for me. Like, I'm like really trying to do this. See, that was me seeking out the assistance and he smiled and it was like I pushed a, tra uh, uh, a, 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 a hidden door and he said yeah you're right you need to put me in 30 in front of 30 people in the next 30 days but I got it that's 8531 eight appointments we need to do eight, we need to do 30 appointments in the next 30 days guys I, so the second part of uh of coachability seeking out is the first part the second part is accepting the coaching even if it's not what you wanted to hear, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's inconvenient. You ask that person a question, they're successful. You ask them for a reason, except what they tell you. Don't go try to find somebody else to ask because they didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. So the second thing I said, I got it. And, and then the third part of it is completely internalize it and go do that and then some. I put him on 40 appointments in the next three weeks. 
16 KPs, 24 recruiting appointments. Do you think I was relatively confident in my ability to make the presentation after three weeks? Now think about this, y'all. Think about this. A week and a half in, I got a phone call from my agent who I had called a week earlier and told him I appreciate it, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, because I had already signed a contract with the what is now the G League. It was the D League in his second in its second year at that point. I had already signed the contract. And they were talking about different, I had about four different teams talking about we're gonna call you up once things get rolling. Da, 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 da. I, I had asked them to let me out of the contract. They had let me out of the contract, right? My dad called me on a early, early, early on a Saturday morning. He said, now, and there's so many parts of this that I don't have the time to go through, but he called me early on a Saturday morning and said, listen, I know you're very excited about Primerica. I think you're going to be extremely successful, but I would feel bad if I didn't tell you this. Your agent called, you've got an offer, and he told me, come meet with him. I met with him at the house. He said, you got an offer to go to Italy. They're going to pay, pay you $200,000 house and pay for a car. And uh, it's on the table. Now, you do what you want to do. I'm just letting you know that I would not want to you know, let you know that that was on the table. I'm going to licensing class on the first day of licensing class. Italy, 200,000 house, car, one year contract. I already had the, the, all I had to do was say yes. They buy the plane tickets. I'm out. I'm going to licensing class. I told him, no. Nah, I'm going to do this, do Primerica. I'm good. It's not because I didn't love basketball, but I made a long-term decision because I was very confident, right? I didn't say cocky, very confident. In my mind, in my mind, Jackie, I said, this man said he made $250,000 a month. I have a hard time believing any human can be that much better than me. If, he's t if he is, I had a tough time fathoming if he's 10 times better than me, then that still would be $25,000 a month, which is still $30,000, I mean, $300,000 a year, which is still more than what they're offering when they go fly across this water and go play on a bum ankle. And I ain't got to worry about getting weighed, cut, whatever. I ain't got to worry about none of that. So I decided to stay. And interestingly enough, guys, a year later, guess what happened? They offered me another opportunity, but I had gone to RVP and was making $20,000 a month at that point. They offered me to come back. A, a year later, they still offered me a chance to come back and make six figures playing ball, but I had gotten the Prime American was rolling by that. Went to RVP, made 20 grand in, in my fourth month as an RVP. Never looked back, make a quarter million dollars my first year as an RVP. Two, 350 the next two years, 450, 570. My fifth year in Prime American, I was making almost $600,000 a year. And so, you know, we've been able to build a business and I've bought a couple of other businesses and uh, other Primerica businesses and done some things even outside of Primerica. But the bottom line and the foundation has always been Primerica and helping a lot of other people to have success. And there is not another opportunity, you all, like what we have. And the three common denominators of success in anything in Primerica is no different. Coachability. A coach will really argue, do you seek out the help or do you wait for somebody to bring it to you, right? right? Do you accept and internalize the coaching, right? Do you go do that and then some? That's what true coachability is. The second thing is focus. Are you able to stay focused in the midst of life happening? The good, the bad, the ugly, the up, the down, the hot, the cold. Can you stay focused in the midst of life, right? And the third thing is work ethic. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10 says, the man that does not work shall not eat. It doesn't get a lot more in your face than that. Right? I didn't say that. Right? You might think I was, I was insensitive if I said that. I didn't say that. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10, go look it up. The man that does not work shall not eat. If you don't eat, you die. Does that make sense? So work in Primerica, prospect, get on appointments, I mean, set appointments, get on appointments, train, teach over and over and over and over and over again. Don't complicate it, y'all. It's not complicated. You just got to, the consistency of effort.
makes all the difference in the world. So guys, uh, I'm going to throw it back to the Ortizes with that. And hopefully you got a little bit of insight this morning.